it is time now to explore how to implement the data persistency layer of our application through Spring Boot 2.2 platform. Now in this chapter, we will be emphasizing how to use JPA 2.2 specification to access and manipulate our PostgreSQL data source. Some of our videos will be providing details on how to use MyBatis 3 framework as the running ORM of our application instead of the default Hibernate 5. Now, aside from the relational database approach, we will be learning how to perform data persistency using MongoDB NoSQL data source. Advanced topics such as using Query DSL predicates, Spring Data REST, and Spring Hatios will also be covered. Let us now start our first entry, which is performing data persistency using Spring Data JPA 2.2. Now, Spring Data is a huge framework composed of different modules which aims to provide easy access to data repository and cloud services. And one of these modules is the Spring Data JPA, which helps provide and build non boilerplate data repository for our application. Let us now begin our detailed discussion on how to implement the data repository layer using the Spring Data JPA 2.2 module. Before we proceed with the setup and configuration of our Spring Data JPA module, let me show you the five essential tables our application needs at this moment. First, the sign up table schema, which will consist of all the user records of the application. The login table here, which will contain all of the login credentials of the approved and valid users. The harvest table, which will contain all of the records of the harvested goods posted for sale. The location, which depicts all of the market locations where the goods are to be sold. And the basket table schema, which contains all of the ordered goods. As depicted in the ERD design here, each table has exactly one primary key. And then login table has a one-to-one -one relationship with sign up. Same through with location to harvest. Moreover, basket has a many-to-one -one relationship to sign up as well as to the harvest table. At this point, let us download post 11s installer and install it into our system. After installing our Postgre 11 server and setting up its root user account, let us run its PG admin management tool to create our database schema. Let us click this drop down here and log into our system using our root user account. Click OK. And then we create our database schema which I named FHMS for Farm Harvest Management System. Then afterwards, we expand this database schema details, go to schemas, and through its default table space, we create the five tables from our ERD design. After setting up correctly our database schemas, we can now proceed with our Spring Data JPA implementation. A separate Spring Boot 2.2 project is created here to specifically highlight the implementation of our Spring Data JPA layer together with some Spring Boot test components here which will be used to run and execute some of our repository methods later. But before that, we need to configure our Gradle build to include the jar file which contains the JDBC driver class of our PostgreSQL. Be sure to have the appropriate and updated version of the jar file to avoid some unwanted exceptions. And most of all, we need to include the Spring Boot starter for our Spring Data JPA. After rebuilding our Gradle repository because of the additional dependencies we made, we need to open the application properties file of our project to register some important Spring Boot properties starting with this data source configuration which includes the JDBC URL of our FHMS data store in our PostgreSQL server.
the username password of the root user account of our PostgreSQL server we are using, and some Hickory CP connection pooling related properties. Since Spring Boot 2.2 uses Hickory CP as its default connection pool. And speaking of default, Spring Boot 2.2 uses Hibernate 5 framework as its JPA provider implementation. Thus, we need to register at least one JPA Hibernate property to avoid some exception. And lastly, we need to configure some JPA related settings such as Show SQL and Hibernate Format SQL. Since Spring Boot 2.2 automatically enables all JPA repositories without configuring anything in its Bootstrap class, we do not need to worry about implementing another configuration class just to set up our persistence context and entity manager. Therefore, this brings us to the first step, which is defining our entity classes. Entity classes or entities are plain old Java objects, which represent the table schemas we defined in PostgreSQL a while ago. And these entity classes are always decorated with the entity annotation. If so happen that the table name does not match with the entity class name here, we can decorate the class with the table annotation to force the mapping. An entity class consists of properties which exactly match with the column definition of their table schema counterpart. It has an ID property which can be either integer or long integer and is mapped to the primary column definition of their corresponding table schema. Now this ID property must be decorated with the ID annotation and sometimes with the generated value annotation to assign an identifier to it generated depending on the chosen generation type. In this application, I will not be associating generated value annotation to all my ID properties. Now the rest of the properties here will be decorated with the column annotation to map the property to the metadata of their corresponding column definition. When it comes to table relationships, JPA has some additional annotations which can be used to establish bidirectional relationships between two table schemas on an entity level. Based from our ERD, our login table has a one-to-one -one relationship with the sign-up table schema, which makes our profile entity here that represents our sign-up table schema as the parent entity and the login entity class here as our child entity. In this kind of relationship, it is always the child entity that owns the relationship. Thus, this login entity class here must have an additional property of profile type decorated by two JPA annotations, namely the join column and the one-to-one. -one. The join column annotations registers and specifies a separate user ID column of login table as a foreign key, whereas this one-to-one -one Annotation here establishes a one-way relationship to the sign-up table by linking this user ID foreign key to the profile entity class through this newly added property. Whereas in the profile entity class, it must also have an additional property of login type decorated only by one annotation, namely the one-to-one. -one. This one-to-one -one annotation creates an inverse relationship back to the login entity class, which makes the relationship bidirectional. It carries some attributes such as the integrity constraints of the relationship, the association fetch type used during data retrieval, and the map by attribute, which tells JPA that there is a profile property in the login child entity class that points or references to the ID property of the profile entity class. Now this property is considered as a back reference and excluded from data extraction or consumption. After creating the entities, the next step is to implement the repository classes 
by utilizing some of the interfaces provided by the Spring Data JPA module. Its Spring Data Commons library has a crude repository interface which can generate query methods that can solely used for crude transactions. Some of its interfaces will be discussed in the next advanced videos. The Spring Data Core library itself has a JPA repository interface which can generate all combined query methods that the Spring Data Commons interfaces can provide. Spring Data JPA repositories are custom interfaces that inherits all the generic methods of the generic interfaces CURD repository and JPA repository. Each repository implementation manages only one entity class. That is why these generic interfaces will require us to indicate in its first placeholder the type of the entity needed to be managed and on the second placeholder the type of the ID property of that entity class. Now in Spring Boot 2.2, decorating all our repository implementation classes with the repository annotation is an option. Now to check what query methods are generated for our location repository, let's create a location service component here inside this service package. Let's inject our location repository. So here I have a get all market lock which retrieves or utilizes the find all method from my location repository. And then to save all the location records, we have the save method from the location repository. And to update, we still use the same save method generated for our location repository. And lastly, to delete a uh, location record from our data store, we use the delete by ID query method generated for our location repository. So all of these methods are auto-generated by our Spring Data JPA module. What if there is a requirement that needs to retrieve all the market location based on some owner's name and product delivery date? What if there is a need for a query transaction that needs to retrieve all the location records based on some complex constraints? Spring Data JPA allows us to suggest some query methods with constraints that are not available by default for the module to generate. The only thing is, all of these suggested methods must start with prefixes such as find by, read by, count by, get by, or query by, followed by a property name that will serve as the filter for the query transactions. Now, for complex constraints, Spring Data JPA recognizes some keywords such as is, equals, and, or, true, and false, which can be used to come up with filter context in the name of the query methods. Now, all of these valid query methods will be automatically generated and implemented by Spring Boot 2.2 since it follows the query lookup strategy by default in its JPA repository configuration. So if I want to retrieve all the profile records given a certain name without considering any case sensitivity, I can include in my profile repository here this find by name ignore case abstract method with its string name query parameter. And if I want to search for all the profile records given a uh, username and password, I can consider this find by username and password abstract method with its query parameters, username, and password in this order, since in the context of the method name, the username property comes before the password property. And if I want to know the profile records, whose username starts with a certain prefix, I can include also this find by username starting with abstract method with its string prefix query parameter. And if I want to know all the valid users of the application, I can also consider this find by approved true method. Now, all of the implementation of these query transactions will be taken care of the Spring Data JPA.
What if our suggested query methods requires custom query transactions based from the client's SQL requirement? Spring Data JPA has a query annotation which can declare a custom SQL statement and if valid can be possibly executed by the Spring Data JPA manager. Since there is no a default query method that returns a list of profile objects I want to include into my profile repository here, this find profiles abstract method decorated with a query annotation which bears a native select statement. Now be sure to set the annotations native query attribute here to true whenever we want to execute a native SQL statement. And since we are implementing a JPA 2.2 specification here, I want to include a query method that returns a stream of profile objects, which executes a Java persistence query language from profile. If a query statement requires some query parameter values, the query annotation can provide those values through either name parameter or numbered placeholder. Name parameter are declared and bound to the local parameter of the query method through the param annotation. In order to include the name parameter in the query statement, it must be preceded by a colon. On the other hand, working with numbered placeholder is quite similar to the placeholder concept of Java SQL's prepared statement. The first index here fetches the value of the first local parameter, while the second index fetches the second. Index placeholder are always preceded by a question mark. By the way, all of these parameter passing mechanisms both apply to JPQL and native SQL statements. Query annotation together with the modifying annotation can both be used to implement transactional operations such as update and delete. Instead of using the default delete operations, I have created here a custom delete by username query method which can execute this custom delete operations I created. Also, instead of using the default save method, I have included here an update by username query method with the following custom update transaction. Always set the clear automatically attribute of the modifying annotation to true in order to flush the updated values to the data store. And since this is JPA 2.2, we can now create individualized named query and native named query. All we need to do is to go to the entity class concerned and declare each of our named query at the class level. Just be sure that all the names of the named query must be preceded by the entity class name followed by a dot operator. To bind our name queries into the profile repository, we need to use the name of our named queries as the method names of their respective query method, excluding the entity class name and the dot operator. And then we complete and build the appropriate method signature. Aside from stream of objects, Spring Data JPA 2.2 can now generate query methods that returns asynchronous process components such as future, completable future, and listenable future. After several discussions on how to use Spring Data JPA 2.2 module, it is time now to run some of the generated query methods we have in our repository layer. Now, Spring Boot 2.2 platform recommends data JPA testing to test repository transactions. And the platform has a data JPA test annotation, which we need to decorate on our test class in order to configure the JUnit 5 framework and at the same time provide the appropriate testing environment for JPA repositories. Also, to replace the in memory database for testing, with the appropriate PostgreSQL data source we configured in our application.properties file, we need also to decorate our test class with this auto configure test database annotation, 
with its replace attribute set to replace that none. After appropriately setting up our test class, it is now time to inject data source, JDBC template, or entity manager if we really need them during testing. Now, we can inject our profile repository into this test class in order to test its query methods, starting with its save method here and find profile. So let's run this test method now. So we have here the inserted profile record and the whole four records here are the output of our find profiles. And then we run this test method here which save multiple profile objects using save all method. Let's run it. From the output of our find profiles, we can see that these two records were inserted at the same time using save all. And lastly, for the meantime, let's run this test method here, which tests and execute this find stream profiles method, which returns a stream of profile object. Let's run it. And since stream output is asynchronous in nature, we can see that there is an overlapping result given to us by our Eclipse IDE. This first video of Chapter 3 provides us a complete detail of information on how to use Spring Data JPA 2.2 in implementing repository layer. Huge information. Majority of the information presented in here will be used in the preceding videos.